Hello and welcome to Good Conversations. We're honored to have with us today my friend Angela Park, founder and director of Diversity Matters, a nonprofit organization that aims to make diversity and inclusion foundational ass assets of environmental and social change. She, previously, uh, among other things, she worked at the White House in both terms of the Clinton-Gore administration and co-founded and served as deputy director of the Environmental Leadership Program, where I was a fellow. She lives on an organic farm and a 270-acre ecological co-housing community in Vermont with her husband and two children, and is in Montana now for a meeting of Women's Voices for the Earth, the Missoula-based group, for whom she serves as vice chair of the board of directors. Welcome, Angela. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time on a Sunday. And I should mention to our viewers, we should give thanks to Frank Tyro for being willing mm -hmm. to come in on a Sunday to record us. <laughs> Uh, well, we're recording this on December 21st, mm. uh, the winter solstice. Um, it's not only the shortest day of the year, but probably the coldest. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of the weather here in Montana? I love it. I feel right at home. Uh. I think it's particularly uh, amazing to be in a very different landscape than Vermont. So uh. similar, but so different. I love it. Hmm. Yeah. Have you been to Montana before? I've been here twice before uh -huh. for meetings related to Women's Voices for the Earth, but this is uh, one of the first times I've really gotten to see uh, another part of Montana. The yeah. last time I was here, I went to Yellowstone, so uh. I was mostly in Wyoming, but um, it was lovely. Uh. Well, we're happy to have you here. Um, yeah, first, let's start with telling our viewers in a nutshell about your organization, Diversity mm -hmm. Matters. What is it and what does it do? So Diversity Matters is a national nonprofit and we are mission driven and our mission is to really try to make uh, environmental social change more effective in the 21st century. And we believe that one of the core assets that really are not um, fully realized are being able to integrate diversity and inclusion throughout the work of most environmental social change movements and organizations. Hmm. It's a, a gap and that's what we try to fill. Hmm. Well, that's great. Um, I mean, so in, in this work, uh, you're trying to, to address a central problem in our society, really. I mean, it's, it must be it must be difficult rowing a lot of times. I mean, how do you go about it? Tell, tell us if an organization hires you to come in and, mm -hmm. and help them out, what do you typically do? Well, there are a whole range of ways in which we work with different clients, and clients can be organizations that hire us to help them really figure out some of these issues within the context of their system. And we also have programs for individuals that are more about leadership development, because if you're going to try to change a culture of a movement or an organization, it takes actual individual people to be able to build the skills to do that. Right. Um, but one of the things we're trying to do, too, is to, and the reason why this is an institution versus just a consulting firm, mm -hmm. is that I've worked in this field now, uh, the field of sustainable development and sustainability, um, for 20 years. And in that 20 years, not a lot has changed mm. <laughs> on these issues that... Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, yeah. Th that I, I mean, certainly we've seen movement in a number of um, specific arenas, but I would not say when you step back and look at environmental and social change organizations, they have really figured out how to be diverse and inclusive in a way that prepares us to succeed hmm. um, in, in the new reality of the world, not to mention what's coming in the future. Hmm. So part of what we do too is really communicate and provide the space for people to come together about these issues at all. Yeah. Diversity and inclusion are huge words. Mm -hmm. They're like sustainability. If you don't define it, it can mean everything and nothing. Right. Um, and so we also um, consider communications and resource um, building. Um, and by that I mean there's so many different levels at which you can do this work. So certainly we spend a lot of our time working with organizations. Mm -hmm. um, but an organization can only shift and move and figure out how to integrate this work throughout all of its programming um, when you actually provide resources that help people understand why these issues are even an issue. Hmm. You know, um, okay. one of the problems, I think, and why it's harder, for example, if you just look at environmental organizations, is a lot of the largest national organizations are organizations that um, are populated, you know, if you think about the board and the staff, of people that don't have a really broad spectrum of life experience and representation that mirrors U.S. society, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to get down to brass tacks, I mean, historically, environmental 
groups in this country mm -hmm. have tended to be white upper middle class, right? They have, and also, you know, if you think about the, the history of the conservation movement, for example, where, you know, part of this work was about conserving land and actually keeping people completely away from it. Absolutely. So it was, it was almost as if um, wilderness as a concept was some pristine thing that we didn't want sullied by human beings. Mm -hmm. And if it was going to be sullied by human beings, certain human beings were more right. um, acceptable and, you know, allowed to come, you know, onto these wilderness properties. Right. And we haven't fully dug into that history, right. nor have we really figured out how we build a new skill set for the new realities. Hmm. It's interesting because in some ways it's about a redefinition of what environmentalism mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's about shifting from kind of setting aside these uh, pristine places mm. to building a sustainable society where we live every day. Mm -hmm. And it's making the connection between a sustainable society and an equitable society, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I think um, a lot of the work I do right now is about trying to connect movements. You know, right now we have a pretty fractured, um, if you look at the progressive landscape, and by progressive I mean people who are trying to really make this a just and sustainable world in a variety of ways, whether it's education or um, environmentalism or it's about, you know, women's rights or it's about... Um, community development, I, I think there are ways in which the environmental movement really has segregated itself, um, and part of it's based on what you were just saying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you think about the environmental justice movement, where the EJ movement has defined environment as the places where we live, work, play, and worship, that's a much more holistic way to talk about the environment in which everyone feels like, okay, I, that clearly connects to who I am. Whereas if we talk about environment as the pristine wilderness alone, by virtue of our environmental history and our, you know, our culture and, and U.S. history, there are certain people who feel attracted to being connected to yeah. that and other people who don't. Yeah. Um, and if it, it's not about... Um, turning upside down our values and saying this is, you know, we're going to brand ourselves as a completely different kind of a right. movement. But right. I think thinking about how we communicate says everything about who wants to come to the conversation. Yeah. And I mean, it's, as you say, it's not either or. I mean, there are groups arising mm -hmm. or, or changing in ways that embrace both these things. Absolutely. The, the building of a sustainable and just society and also protecting biodiversity and, right. and protecting wilderness place areas. and. Well, and I think this is the area where, um, oddly enough, we don't do a very good job given the fact that um, we so value and appreciate and are grounded in nature. Mm -hmm. um, the environmental field, um, I think, has a lot of work to do to figure out how we're interdependent as organizations within the spectrum of the environmental movement broadly. Right. And yeah. I use the term environmental as broadly as I would say right. the, you know, the environmental justice community frames it. Yeah. Um, you know, you always want wilderness groups. You know, I don't want some of the national organizations that work on wilderness issues to suddenly decide that they're going to go into youth education yeah. um, instead. I think those groups need to be there, but they need to be connected Absolutely. in, in a, a way that's more holistic and also could, to, who can talk to people about why wilderness does matter, mm -hmm. even if you're someone who lives in the center city in a you know, three-bedroom apartment and your place to play is the local playground. Right. Um, so the, I, your that's, your that's milk and your thing. eggs and your vegetables don't, in fact, come from the grocery store either. Well, exactly. <laughs> you know, and so how do you find that sense of connection to the land? I mean, yeah. one of the things that I love about living um, on an organic farm is my children are growing up and they know that that cow gave its life so that we could eat this hamburger. Yeah. Um, and and they know. I mean, my daughter actually knows the names of all the chickens on our property. With she and her friends have this whole chicken club going on. And they actually know them as, mm -hmm. as, as true, almost like people. I mean, they, each right. chicken has its own character. Um, yeah. And they know that the eggs that they eat in the mm -hmm. morning or yeah. um, for lunch are, are a gift that we get from you know, those beings. It's an yeah. extraordinary thing. And I think we've lost touch with a lot of that. Yeah. And I actually think one of the reasons why we've lost touch is not only because of you know our um, agro-industrial society and the ways in which we have bifurcated a lot of how we um, get our consumer goods, but also yeah. because when we talk about land and agriculture, we talk about it in ways that don't connect with some people's daily lives. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they feel like that's someone else's problem, someone right. else's issue, someone else's pet project. Right. But it really isn't about me and my life and my concerns and my sphere of influence. And that's what I think is really at the core of 
being able to shift um, people's engagement. And to me, diversity matters is about um, recognizing that we have to have um, a different kind of investment mm -hmm. as organizations in the work of not only being inclusive organizations where people who are different, or as well as people who are not different, can really be an effective and productive team um, and work well together toward a common mission, but also that in the program work of uh, nonprofit organizations, we have to be thinking about who are our core constituencies? How come there are only certain kinds of people who are attracted to our issue? What is it that we're not doing to be able to connect and create a broader um, set of folks who care about this work, who are partners in this work, who are going to help us succeed in the political and policy? Policy realm, or, um, or or really, who can can bring in their perspectives that help us do the work better? Yeah, is part of that somehow getting the message out more powerfully that this group can make a difference for what matters to you in your life, and by being a part of this group, by being active in it, you're welcomed into it. I mean, it's mm. partly a cultural component that way, but also it'll make a difference for you and your community. Yeah, I, I think um, this is actually a really important issue, exactly what you're putting on the table that a lot of organizations are facing and that they ask us for help and support to work on, which is, you know, we work on Organization X, whether it's climate change or wilderness or um, uh, advocating for reproductive justice. And there are these people out there who are currently not anywhere connected to our organization. So in some cases, for example, it's, it's communities of color, it's people of color, sometimes it's young people. You know, so there are a whole variety of groups that are underrepresented that we want to, desperately to engage, but we don't know how. And so a lot of times people go and they say, okay, well, I'm gonna take, you know, um, climate change. You know, I'm gonna take the, the horror of what polar bears and the potential extinction of polar bears in the next you know, 20, 30, 40 years. I'm gonna take this issue and I'm gonna get these people to care about it. So I'm gonna march up to them and I'm gonna say, you need to start caring about the polar bear. Mm -hmm. Rather than saying, hi, I'm Angela and I work for this organization and we're really interested in X, Y, and Z, but I really am interested in making some stronger partnerships with your community. What do you care about? Mm -hmm. What's on your agenda right sure. now? What are the major concerns facing your neighborhood? Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about um, what it means to create the world that we want, what are the things that are really rising to the top for you? Mm -hmm. And you start with asking the question, and then you say, huh, mm -hmm. that is so connected to this piece of work that mm -hmm. we're doing. And to me, that's about how you start the dialogue, because the marching up with your agenda and, you know, inflicting it on someone else has right. now, been tried a lot. It's not working so well. <laughs> before we take a quick break, um, are there any organizations that have kind of taken that that change in approach to mm. heart? I think there are. It's hard for me to name names um, because I would say there are certain organizations that have done a really good job at certain pieces of this. It's not like there are organizations you could say, oh, well, here's the model of exactly what you should do. I, should get, I can give that a little thought. Um, off the top of my head, though, you know, I have a hard time naming, like, these are the fabulous groups you should follow in every single footsteps. Because I think different groups are taking on different kinds of the work and, and really working at it and testing it out. Right. But I would say there are quite a few organizations that have this as a priority. Yeah. Um, they haven't figured it all out. Right. They're not totally there, but they're taking it on in a very big way. Hmm. So the Sierra Club is actually one of our clients, mm -hmm. and they um, recently adopted, you know, an organization-wide diversity plan. You hmm. know, the Trust for Public Land That's is wonderful. another environmental organization that's been taking this on in a, in a big way nationally. Right. Um, I think the Sierra Club is actually a very different organization than its image mm -hmm. makes people assume, um, sort of. Yeah. But let's take a quick break and we'll continue in a moment. To our viewers, please don't go anywhere. We'll just take a one minute break. We'll be right back. There is a dangerous storm we must watch for. The storm is strong. If you notice or experience these sudden warning signs, call 911 immediately. Numbness or weakness of the face, arm, or leg, especially on one side of the body. Loss of vision, speech, or understanding. Trouble walking or dizziness. Sudden severe headache or confusion. Preserve our nation. Know the signs and watch for the storm. You could save a life. And welcome back. We're continuing our conversation today with Angela Park, my friend and the director and founder of Diversity Matters, a nonprofit organization based in Vermont. Uh, and 
before the break, Angela, we were talking a little bit about um, the effort of your group and you as a consultant mm -hmm. uh, to help groups change, to become more effective and also more inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is, uh, you were mentioning uh, changing the culture of an organization. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know in the article that I read that was included in, in as a chapter in the book, um, you talked about teaching cultural competence. Mm -hmm. um, my experience has been that's really hard, <laughs> <laughs> is uh, changing the basic culture of a long established organization, mm. especially if you don't have kind of wholesale change on the board of directors, mm. um, things like that. But um, tell me about that that difficulty. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's one thing to start a new group with kind of a refreshing new approach on mm. these things. It's another to go and change the mm. existing culture of a group, isn't mm. it? Yeah, wow. It's a big question. Um, <laughs> well, the first thing I would say is that um, Culture is generational, um, it's cumulative, and generation by generation we pass on our culture. So one of the reasons why it's so hard to change a culture of an organization, for example, is that um, as soon as you come into an organization, you know, in implicit and explicit ways, you're told very clearly um, what are the norms and policies and practices. This is what it means to be a part of, you know, mm -hmm. organization X. And people pass on that culture from generation to generation. So it's deeply ingrained. It's baked in. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, and not all of it's conscious either, Oh, is most it? of it yeah. is not, in yeah. fact. In yeah. fact, it, the example that my colleagues and I often give people when we talk about organizational culture is that there's certainly the personnel policy, there's certainly the mission, there's all the stuff you put on the website, but in many ways, uh, the easiest way to get a sense of someone's culture in an organization is to say, if you work in that organization and your best friend came to work tomorrow for that organization, and you had to tell that best friend, now listen, if you want to succeed here, these are the things no one's going to tell you, but you've got to make sure that you do the following things. Hmm. It's about how you address, what kind of things you talk about, how you engage with your colleagues. It's everything from... Um, you know, uh, how we communicate to each other when we're in a meeting, to um, what we dress, to the kinds of things we talk about, you know, uh, from our, outside of our work life into the work life. Right. So culture change is um, enormous and it's actually essential. Hmm. Um, and the example I would give you is that um, we actually haven't had a conversation about defining what diversity is. And in my view, um, diversity is really about, is nothing more than the measure of the difference in a system. Hmm. It's, it's a measure of the heterogeneity of any given system. And so when people say, oh, well, Angela's really diverse, but you know that Tom, he's not. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, diversity is not something you can ascribe to a person. Hmm. And one of my pet peeves, and one of the things I'm gonna eradicate in my lifetime if I can, is to get rid of this notion that there's a diverse community or a diverse person and a not diverse community or not diverse person. Every system has some degree of diversity. What people oftentimes are meaning when they say that person's diverse or not diverse is that there's a certain kind of diversity that they're looking for or feels underrepresented. And in my view, you can't start talking about culture, you can't start working on inclusion, you can't start working on diversity if you can't talk about things explicitly. Mm. So if you're saying, gosh, we really need to figure out how to engage the, you know, the Native American community, then say the Native American community. Mm -hmm. Don't say those diverse communities out there. Mm -hmm. And if you're really talking about race, then call it race. It's mm -hmm. if it's a gender issue, talk about it as gender. Mm. Um, if it's about how people um, experience level in their organization, mm -hmm. which is certainly a power dynamic, then talk about that as mm -hmm. we have some issues around level. Mm. Um, so that's part of it. But I think in order to change a culture, you have to get clear about um, how diversity and inclusion are different. So a lot of the example I was going to give you is that a lot of um, colleagues in this work will come to me and say, you know, we have this job opening, mm -hmm. and could you help me find some candidates, candidates, people of color, to apply for this job? Mm -hmm. Now, depending on who you are, I may or may not help you for a variety of reasons. <laughs> and one is, depending on the culture of the organization, I don't know that that organization is actually ready for the diversity that they're trying to reach out to. Mm -hmm. Because if you, know, you bring, it could just end up being tokenism or something. Well, yeah, and if you bring someone who's different into an organization that's not prepared to manage that difference, yeah. that person has a really bad experience, yeah. and the organization has a bad experience, and all you do is create a revolving door mm. in which the people who are different come in and leave quickly because they think that this um, organization's culture just does not connect with them. Mm. So I think there's... Um, 
a, a, a real importance to get clear about what is culture, how is it created. And I actually do think you can make culture shifts. You can't do it without a few essential ingredients, um, one being leadership at the top of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, diversity in organizations is not a democratic thing in the sense that if you have people across the organization who really care about it but don't have the support of the leadership at the top, right. you really can't sustain that kind of change and that momentum and that work mm -hmm. um, without doing it. But there's a contextual question before you even get to culture change, which is the conversation around what do we mean by diversity for this organization? Mm -hmm. Why does diversity really matter to our mission? Mm -hmm. um, I think many people who are working to create um, a better world from a you know what I would call a progressive lens oftentimes forget that question because hmm. they think well oh this is the right thing to do you know yeah. this is core it's, to our values. It's an assumption rather than really figuring out why exactly. We need to, yeah. But you have to answer that question because if it's not about making you a better organization, hmm. if it's not directly connected to your mission, if you can't answer the questions around how are we going to fail if we don't become a more diverse and inclusive organization you're not going to be able to sustain this hard organizational work, yeah. especially in the context. And you context. have to make sure every board member is on board with that, too. Well, not right? every. Oh. You know, you're never going to get every <laughs> single person to be uh -huh. fully on board, but you have to have a critical mass of uh -huh. the leadership at uh -huh. the top. And you need to have an executive director that really understands and is willing to, to push the organization. And the context for this is that most nonprofit organizations don't have a lot of organizational development resources. Yeah. There's hardly, um, I, I can think of very few nonprofits that have, you know, a real professional development fund to help, you know, people within the organization build their professional right. skills and that increase was, their abilities. Absolutely. I mean, that was certainly my experience, you know, when I was the only, well, we have one paid consultant and then I was the only paid staff member mm -hmm. of this little local organization here. Mm -hmm. and. What do you advise groups that are in that position that really don't have access to more funds to do mm. a big effort in mm. kind of culture change within the organization? Well, that's the um, literally the sixty-four thousand dollar question, um, and I think uh, because that's how much it costs sixty-four thousand. <laughs> because really, we couldn't raise that much. <laughs> it doesn't have to cost that much. It can often cost less. It can cost a lot more. Uh, you know, the context for this, I think, is the way in which nonprofits raise their money. Um, and so if you think about an organization that is, you know, 95% white in its board and staff right now, and its membership and its volunteer core and its individual donor base is overwhelmingly white as well, it's really hard to figure out how do we make this a priority without having that mission-driven conversation. But if you think about it, there's a world just like, um, General Motors could not sell cars to only you know women in their 20s. You know they have to be thinking about broader demographics, and I would say these movements do too. Mm -hmm. There's money to be had in places that look different than many of our core memberships, um, and so that's a lost opportunity because there are plenty of people who care about clean water, for mm -hmm. example, who are not you know giving money to a lot of organizations that yeah. we work on water issues because they don't feel connected to it. But a huge part of this is foundations. Mm -hmm. And so I've had a lot of conversations. I have a lot of actual clients. I have a lot of, I do some consulting with foundations. And so I have cl clients who are foundations. And when I talk to them about it, the foundations will tell you, listen, there's no neon D. And this is what I tell my clients too. There's no neon D with a pot of gold to fund all of your diversity and professional development and organizational development and capacity building efforts. Mm. You have to build that into your budget. And foundations will tell me, if I just gave someone a $700,000 grant or a $70,000 grant, and that organization chose to allocate none of it toward this kind of capacity building, then they can't come back to me and tell me, now I need the, the money with this neon diversity sign on it. Yeah. They need to build it into their budgets. Yeah. That said, it's also true that foundations, um, I think, also need to be pushing grantees to figure the, you know, out how to allocate this. And it all gets down to, do you see this as this thing over there that as soon as time get hard and nonprofit and now, think about how economic times get hard for nonprofits. Mm -hmm. If it's not built in and integrated and connected to who you are, what you do, how you do your work, it's going to become the thing that falls off the wayside every single couple of years right. when, when times get hard. Well, let's touch just for a moment on what you see in kind of the big picture mm. is the connection between equity and sustainability. Why are those things related? Well, you know, I, I try to make these analogies. Um, with folks who spent their lifetime caring about nature and caring about um, 
you know, the ability of, of the earth to sustain itself forever. And, you know, biodiversity works in nature and diversity works in human systems too. Mm. You know, we are, we are missing a large number of voices and perspectives and ways of connecting um, to much broader constituencies, constituencies that could actually help us better do our work, mm. that would give us more political impact. Um, I, I think it's so connected because you know, if we really do believe that everything is hitched to everything else, like John Muir said, then we have to get the people part of that too. Mm -hmm. And I think environmentalism is not this thing over here. Nature is not this thing over there. It's deeply connected to our food, yeah. how we move around, the homes we live in. You know, um, it, it's, it's connected to the fabric of our you know, day to day lives in a way that I don't think we oftentimes frame it. Yeah. You know, I, I also sometimes think that you know, one of the fundamental problems we face in terms of sustainability and the growing global crisis we face environmentally is that we have an economic system that's global now mm -hmm. that assumes and depends on, must have, the mm -hmm. capacity for infinite growth mm -hmm. within a finite system. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a contradiction mm -hmm. that you can't resolve. And so, you know, a big part of our existing social and economic system is inequity. Yeah. And and so there are certain structural ways where the movement towards a more equitable society, a more socially just society, yeah. is has to be integral. I think that's totally true, and it, there is a way in which it's easy to despair because those are such huge systems that we have to change. But in the end, I think that um, one of the ways in which I really um, connect these issues to is that Environmental issues are like many other kinds of goods in society. Mm. The people who are the poorest and the most marginalized are the people who suffer the most and have the least access to the good things and the direct um, harm from the bad things. Mm. So this is forever work. Yeah. You know, um, my, one of my favorite poems is a poem called To Be of Use by Marge Piercy. Mm. And the way it ends, it says um, something like, you know, a pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. Mm. You know, I, I love this work because I think this is the real work of the world and it's going to be forever and I may not see, you know, that, that tree grow and, uh, to full uh, height in my lifetime, but I'll know I planted that seed. Hmm. Wow. Well, that's a, a beautiful poem and a beautiful note to end on. Mm. I wish we had another hour <laughs> to keep talking about this stuff. I'll have to come back to Montana. That's a deal. <laughs> thank maybe you for when having me. Oh, thank you. And maybe next time when it's a little warmer out. <laughs> that would be fun too. <laughs> but hopefully not too warm. <laughs> we do have this ongoing thing with global warming. <laughs> yeah, we don't want that by any stretch. <laughs> no. Well, thank you, Angela. You're welcome. I really appreciate it. And thank you to our viewers for taking the time to watch us. And again, I want to extend a special thanks to Frank Tyro for coming in on a Sunday to record our program today. Many of our viewers really don't recognize how much time and blood, sweat, and tears Roy and Frank have poured in to keep this station going over the years. It's a great community asset, and we hope you'll continue to support it and keep it going in the years ahead. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.